Hello again and welcome to another Warhammer 40k Modern Glory video. In today's episode, we will be continuing our review of the 10th edition Imperial Guard Index. This time, going over everyone's favourite sneaky boys, the Gaunt's Ghosts. Based on the fantastic Black Library novel series by Dan Abnett, the Gaunt's Ghosts represent some of the premier stealth and infiltration operators in the Imperial Guard. However, despite their sterling reputation within their books, the Gaunt's Ghosts have always struggled to find their place on the tabletop. But that might be all about to change with their new 10th edition datasheet. With new and improved weapons and abilities, along with much more streamlined rules, the Gaunt's Ghosts might truly be one of the greatest sleeper units in the new index. And with that rather bold statement made, let us draw our Tanith straight silver, wrap our camo cloaks around us, and sneak right into today's episode. As is tradition, we shall begin this video with a brief overview of what the hell the Gaunt's Ghosts even are. This is for our newer players who might be getting into 10th edition for the first time, but also for veteran longbeards who may be thinking of getting into the guard with 10th edition. In the lore, the Gaunt's Ghosts is the unofficial name for the Tanith First and Only Regiment. They're called the first and only because soon after their founding, their homeworld was destroyed, meaning there will never be any more regiments founded on Tanith. Their home planet, when it was around, was quite unique. It was a forest world, but the trees could move, and this meant that no two paths through the forest were ever the same. This bred into the people of Tanith an unerring sense of direction, and it was often said that they could never get lost. Many regiments in the Guard are known for a signature piece of equipment. For example, the Morden Iron Guard are infamous for their bright parade uniforms that they wear even into battle. And the first and only are no exception. Their Tanith camo cloaks are made of an unknown material, but it seems to be able to blend into any environment that they're in, whether it's urban or forest. And this gives them unparalleled sneaking and infiltration capabilities. Throughout the novel series, these camo cloaks are often described as being wrapped around the soldiers and they use them to sneak past enemies that are right in front of them, literally going under the noses of traitor guard and other heretic forces. Well, at least that's how it goes in the fluff. But what about in the crunch on the tabletop? Well, let us now dive into their data sheet and we'll begin with that unit profile. Similar to a platoon or Cadian command squad, the Gaunt's Ghosts have two unit stat lines within their data card. One of these to represent their enigmatic leader, Ibram Gaunt, and the other to represent the ghost soldiers that accompany him. Ibram Gaunt has a movement of six, toughness three, a four plus save, which is quite nice, a little bit extra than your standard officer, and three wounds, leadership six, which brings him in line with a regular commissar, and objective control of one. Gaunt's profile is pretty similar to that of a platoon commander, just with an extra pip of leadership and also save. But the Gaunt's ghosts accompanying him are anything but regular guardsmen. Sure, they have that movement value of 6, toughness 3, and a 5 plus save that you would expect on a standard infantryman. But each one is packing two wounds. That is pretty remarkable. That means that this little six-man squad is actually dealing with 13 wounds. That makes them pretty chonky. Of course, they are only Leadership 7 and they only have Objective Control 1, but really the secret source there is those extra wounds. Just to go on a brief tangent here before we get into the weapons and war gear, I've seen a lot of people reviewing Gaunt's Ghosts and talking about their data sheet, but I haven't seen anyone significantly pick up on the fact that they're getting two wounds a pop on their basic members in the squad. That to me is something that I think has been overlooked and I feel like a lot of content creators and pundits online are kind of dismissing them as a fluffy narrative unit because of what they were like in previous editions. In 8th and 9th they weren't a particularly good unit. 
But I feel like with the extra wounds and some of the other stuff we're going to look at, these guys truly are a sleeper squad and definitely something you could include in your army without actively handicapping yourself and maybe even boosting your army's potential. But now let's get back to the main topic of the video and start diving into those ranged weapons. Now, one of the ghosts is equipped with Bragg's Auto Cannon. Try again, Bragg being a famous character from the book. In fact, you'll notice several of these weapons are named, and that's because they relate to characters from the series. Now, Bragg's Auto Cannon is heavy, so it does get plus one to hit when the unit stays still, and it has a 48 inch range. It also comes with a strength of nine, AP minus one, and damage three. So far, so Auto Cannon. What makes it special and a little bit interesting is that it has four attacks, which is double that of a normal auto cannon, but it only hits on a five plus. So it's got a good rate of fire, but it's going to struggle to connect those shots. But don't forget, if you stay still, then heavy will give this plus one to hit, bringing it up to a four plus, which starts getting it into decent territory. And you can order this squad to take aim. Suddenly, that auto cannon's hitting on a 3 plus. We chuck a Sentinel into the mix, and you're daring recon, you're getting reroll ones flying around the place. That auto cannon actually becomes more than acceptable. Next up, we've got a bolt pistol, which is the ranged weapon of Ibram Gaunt, the unit leader. There's nothing particularly noteworthy about this weapon apart from the fact it does hit on a 2 plus, but it's still only strength for AP 0, damage 1. More interestingly is Corbex Hotshot Laz Carbine. This has a 24 inch range and it is Assault. So you can move and advance and shoot this weapon with no penalty. Remember that Assault weapons in 10th edition are different to how they were in 9th. In 9th edition they allowed you to move and advance and still shoot but you suffered a minus one to hit penalty. That's gone away now. So you can move and advance with Corbex Hotshot Laz Carbine and some of the other weapons in this unit, which have also got Assault, and you can just shoot at your basic ballistic skill. This makes for Gaunt's Ghost to be quite a rapid moving force and gives it a bit of firepower on the go. Now, Corbex Hotshot Laz Carbine is a three-shot. Remember, this is 24 inch range, so three shots, 24 inch range is not bad at all. Ballistic skill, three plus. Strength 3, AP minus 1, 1 damage. It's essentially like a hotshot Laz gun, but with more shots and the assault capability. Honestly, I kind of advocate for GW making all hotshot Laz guns like this. It would definitely suit the Scion's playstyle of being a unit that hits hard and hits fast. But we're kind of going off on a tangent here now. I just want to say one last thing, which is don't forget, again... This unit can benefit from take aim. And again, it can benefit from all the other things that you're chucking around in your army. So it's not hard to get this Hotshot Lads Carbine up to hitting on twos with additional AP. But that might not be necessary when you take into account the next weapon in this unit. And in my opinion, by far the most powerful. And if you're looking at this unit in terms of damage output, this is the main selling point. Larkin's Long Lads. Now, this is a heavy weapon with precision, so it can target characters in units. Has a 36 inch range and fires one shot. So far, so sniper, right? Well, not really, because it hits on a 2 plus. So you don't even need to stay still to hit on a 2 plus. This thing is always hitting what you need it to hit on. I don't really get the benefit of heavy in this case. Maybe it works if the opponent has got a minus one to hit modifier. And if you stay still, you're still going to be hitting on twos. But yeah, Larkin could apparently hit fire his long last without problems. It gets even spicier when you realize it's strength five, which is significantly stronger than standard sniper rifles. It's AP minus two, and it is a whopping four damage if this thing hits and wounds a space marine standard character like a lieutenant or a captain if they fail their save it's taking their head clean off any light infantry character in the game be it a tau fireblade or an opposing enemy guard officer is gonna get shredded by larkin's long lads in a single hit it very much is a powerful weapon it's almost like having a mini vindicare sniper but you've still got all the other guys that are coming with larkin at the same time 
And speaking of the other guys, we've got a number of them equipped with LAS carbines. These are essentially your standard LAS gun, but again, they're assault 24 inch range with three shots. So these things are putting out as many shots as a guardsman who is first rank fire, second rank firing, but at long range. They're actually really good. Why can't we have more LAS carbines? GW, give me an option to put LAS carbines on my regular guardsman and you'll really start seeing my pure infantry guard forces going up into the stratosphere. But anyway, finally, we do have Rawn's LAS carbine, which is similar to the standard one same attacks range strength all that good stuff the only difference is that it does have sustained hits so anytime you roll a six to hit you're gonna get another hit now one of the big mistakes that i see people make when they're reviewing this unit is they just look at each weapon in isolation but they don't consider the combined firepower this unit has this is a squad which is a similar size to a platoon command squad Yet it can take double the amount of heavy weapon shots with that Bragg's auto cannon. And on top of that, you've got nine Lasgun shots as well, which are all hitting on a better ballistic skill, some of which have got inbuilt good AP and others which are bringing sustained hits to the table. And if that wasn't enough, you've also got a very, very powerful sniper rifle, which is going to supplement your firepower greatly. You put it all together, You've actually got a pretty decent level of DACA. But what I really like about Gaunt's Ghost is not only are you getting the shooty, you're also getting the choppy, which is kind of unique. If you were to get a platoon command squad and give them loads of guns, you wouldn't also be able to make them half decent in combat. But Gaunt's Ghost don't mind getting up close and personal. Gaunt himself comes with five attacks at weapon skill two plus, strength three, AP minus one. Each other ghost is bringing three attacks at weapon skill three plus strength three. And then you've got McColl, who has got his straight silver knife, who brings an additional five attacks at weapon skill two plus strength three, AP minus one, one damage. And he has devastating wounds and precision as well. This means in total, you have 22 attacks coming from this unit, 10 of which are gonna have their own inbuilt AP and are hitting on a two plus. And don't forget, you can still order this squad to fix bayonets, meaning that the remaining regular straight silver attacks, the other 12, are also gonna be hitting on twos if you want them to. Now, let's be clear here. This doesn't mean that Gaunt's Ghosts are going to be able to single-handedly take on Angron or stop a World Eaters army in their tracks. No, they're still just guardsmen. But it gives you a distinct advantage in what I like to call peer-to-peer -peer combat. This is where you have guardsmen taking on their equivalents, their other light infantry, such as enemy guardsmen or fire warriors or guardians or skitari. When fighting factions like these, both sides tend to be fairly well matched because their standard troops are pretty basic. And it's down to each commander to try and find an extra advantage, an extra bit of leverage which can swing the fight in their favor. If you have the capability to fix bayonets and get in amongst your opponent's light infantry and he can't do that and he can't match you, that might just give you the edge you need to swing the game in your favor. Light infantry bullying is definitely something that all guard commanders need to be aware of and have something in the back of their mind and a tool in their toolbox to be able to engage in those kinds of fights. Now, so far, everything we've looked at for Gaunt's Ghosts makes them an interesting unit. They're pretty chonky, their DACA is remarkable, and their close combat capabilities by guard standards is pretty bloody good. But nothing here to make them feel like the ultimate sleeper unit. That's going to change when we move into their abilities, because this takes them from being good to great. Right off the bat, we have a laundry list of core abilities, beginning with fights first. In those peer-to-peer -peer combats where people might not be falling back and you might just want to try and slog it out at bayonet range, having fights first is another tool in your toolbox. It's another edge that's going to tip the fight in your favor. They can also infiltrate which lets them get pretty far up the board outside of the opponent's deployment zone. However, I would caution you from throwing these right into the wolf's face. They are just guardsmen. They might have an extra wound, but they're still T3 and a five plus save. If you just go yeeting them up there, then your opponent's probably gonna breeze through them before you can really feel their potential. 
How I see the infiltrate as being best used is you put the ghost in a position where Larkin can start using his sniper and Brad can use his auto cannon and they can do some nice long range dacker, but it is long range. Or you can get them onto an objective or if you're a Catachan player and you're bringing lots of scouting units, having these guys move up, essentially using infiltrators as kind of like a pseudo scout is a pretty good way of getting orders to those units that are going to be pushing forward. Speaking of orders, what is very, very spicy is Ibram Gaunt can issue two orders. That's the same as Creed. That's the same as Strachan. He is now a full-blown senior officer. And not only can he order regiment units, he can also order Gaunt's ghost units, which, unlike other officers, essentially means he can tell his own squad what to do. Essentially, how I see this is Gaunt can run around telling the other ghosts to fix bayonets or take aim or whatever they might need to do. And he's also got a spare order in his back pocket for another unit that he's supporting. Or if you start finding your other officers are going down and you really need those extra orders to make your infantry pull their weight, having a couple of orders come out of this unit really is quite important. However you slice it. Being able to get two orders out of one officer is always a good thing in the guard, especially now that they don't splash like they did in previous editions. However, there is a little fly in the ointment, which is that Gaunt's ghosts don't have the leader rule, so they can't join on to infantry squads and support them that way. Fortunately, Gaines Workshop has provided a solution by giving the entire unit lone operative. I do think it's a bit ironic that a squad of guys containing six models has got a rule called loan operative, but I'm not one to quibble. I'm just going to take the gift from the gift horse. Loan operative means that this unit cannot be targeted. Doesn't matter if you have precision. Doesn't matter if you have indirect fire. You cannot target this unit with ranged weapons if you are 12 inches or further away. This provides a ridiculous level of durability to the squad. It doesn't matter what their stat line is if they're never going to get targeted. And it opens up so many tactical options. You know, before how I talked about them being used as a fire support unit, I bet a lot of you thought, well, how's that going to work? They're just going to get shot when the enemy sees them and they can't join a squad. Well, the enemy cannot target them and they can just sit there daiquiring away. If you're going into a competitive game and you're likely to find yourself playing on some large L-shaped ruins that are multiple stories high, maybe putting a squad of Gaunt's ghosts on top and taking advantage of plunging fire and giving all the weapons in the squad an extra AP. Bear in mind, these guys don't need to get up close to get rapid fire. They've all got assault weapons with multiple shots. From 24 inches away, you could be blazing at your opponent, taking advantage of born soldiers, getting auto hits with extra AP. You could get these last guns easily up to AP minus three between plunging fire, fields of fire, and a Lemus exterminator. That's looking like AP four on Corbex Hotshot Lads Carbine, AP four on Bragg's Auto Cannon, and a whopping AP five on Larkin's Long Lads just by sitting back and daiquiring with them. Or perhaps you go down the support unit route. This is where you use your Gaunt's Ghost to provide orders to the front line. Sure, they're going to have to stay within six inches of enemy units, but that's okay because you won't be targeted. And this is probably one of the most powerful things about giving this squad loan operative because it solves a really big design flaw, a really big Achilles heel within the guard right now. Because it's all well and good having a Lord Solar. It's all well and good having a Death Corps Marshal supporting 20-man blobs. But those extra 20 ablative wounds aren't going to mean dick the moment your opponent cracks out the scout snipers. You could find your guard command network falling apart very quickly to a handful of your opponent's precision fire. And the ghosts plug that gap. But wait, there's more because you also have stealth. So even if your opponent gets close to you, they're going to be at minus one to hit. And then you've also got Tanith Camo Cloaks, which is a unique rule to the ghosts. Each time a ranged attack targets this unit, models in that unit have the benefit of cover against it. 
Wait, that means Gorn actually is rocking a 3 plus save. And all the ghosts are rocking a 4 plus save. And you can stack that with take cover to increase this even further. I'm not sure that gets Gorn up to a 2 plus save. Because take cover says you can't improve your save beyond a 3 plus using this order. It'd have to come down to how take cover and the benefit of cover interact when you start getting to that level. But at the very least, if we play it safe, this entire unit is now rocking a three plus save and two wounds and minus one to hit. That makes them almost as durable as Space Marines in power armor. It truly is staggering how many defensive buffs that GW has stacked on this. And I think it might be a slight overcompensation for the lack of leader. But hey, I'm not complaining. And don't forget that a lot of these buffs just go away the moment the opponent manages to get into close combat with you. And when that happens, you are going to find these guys fold relatively quickly if you're facing off against a dedicated choppy choppy unit. But there's one more rule we need to cover. And in my opinion, this is the big one. This is the hot tamale, okay? Covert stealth team. At the end of your opponent's turn, if this unit is not within engagement range of one or more enemy units, you can remove this unit from the battlefield. In the reinforcement step of your next movement phase, set it up anywhere on the battlefield that is more than nine inches horizontally away from all enemy models. That's right. This unit can be picked up and can be put back down anywhere on the board every single battle round. This is bonkers. It is mind blowing. The amount of options this opens up to you is unreal. You can use it defensively. Maybe you've got a flank which is starting to fall and crumble and you just need a little bit more firepower over there to secure it and lock it down and contain the situation. Gaunt's Ghost has got you covered. They don't have an insignificant amount of firepower. They'll definitely be able to contribute. Maybe you need to use it aggressively. Your opponent's got a backfill objective. Your indirect fire has been compromised. It's going to get to turn four, turn five, and your scions haven't been able to deep strike in that late. And the enemy screened you out effectively. Don't worry. Gaunt's Ghost got you covered. You nip over there at the last minute. You might just snatch victory from the jaws of defeat. What about on a tactical level? Maybe your opponent has been able to use precision to get rid of some of your officers and you're starting to find your infantry is floundering. Get your Gaunt's Ghost over there. Now, bear in mind, they do come back in your reinforcement step, so they won't be able to give orders the turn they pop over, but the following turns, they're good to go. Or maybe even strategic implications, big picture. You're going for a gambit. You really need that extra unit in that extra table quarter before you're called down the cyclonic torpedoes. Don't worry. Gorn and his lads are going to pop over there, turn five, get into the backfield at enemy table quarter, give you that plus one to the dice roll that might just let you get the victory. And these are just a few examples of how Covert Stealth Team could be used. I'm not exaggerating when I say this ability, when used properly, if you get good with it, you do a bit of practice, could easily be game winning. Of course, that's just like my opinion, man. Let me know what you guys think down in the comment section below. Do you believe that Gaunt's Ghost is still just more of a fluffy narrative unit? Or are you now convinced that the first and only might have a place in your army? If you enjoyed today's video, don't forget to smash that like button and also subscribe to never miss an episode. And if you found today's video particularly enjoyable or informative, then please consider becoming a channel member or Patreon. By supporting the channel, you'll be helping me create content. But at the same time, you will also unlock a whole host of perks for you to enjoy. The biggest of which is access to the Mordian Glory Discord server, an online community with almost 2,000 active members. It's always popping off in the MG Discord. We've got channels for discussing tactics, hobbying, painting, and even a pretty spicy meme section as well. And I just want to take a moment to say a big thank you to all of the latest channel members. 
So thank you to default username Edwin J, Jack Finley, Doot Ronald, Billy, Rick Music, Nick Berry, Kevin Nelson, Sam Zarsky, Necker Loves Cake, Alex Rodriguez, Robin Burt, Strix, Johnny Five, Alexander Berg, Ben Hogan, Stephen, Admiral Galactica, Bass Browser, Neuromancer, Duca15, Milo Moran, Uncle Buck, Nate, Bryson Lay, Toby K, Greg Heist, Christian E, Mass Produce Me, Lowly Strategos, Victor Von Snazdaker, Richard Eric Roth, Brandon Hutchings, Nathaniel Duncan, Midash Guy, Dadum, Hot Cup of Joe, Alexandra Brunn, Wilson Marquis, Monsoir, Giza, Duffsnick, Julian Calero, James Riddle, Radioactive Bear, Ross Shaw, Tech 910, Rob Gailey, Forty Hitter, DB, Anders Morkberg, Colvia, Garen Fick, Razor 667, Miguel Perez, Peter Cronin, HBMV 110, Eric McCombs, Iku Turso, An Innocent, Joe, Alec Trupps, Aid K, Mr. Baxter, Old Goat 1776, Callum McCaig, Unlisted Uniform, Morgan Rudolph, Alan Chapman, Tensler, and Couch Potato. I also want to do a big shout to the latest Patreons as well. So thank you to Jordan Freeman 94, Amy DeSweet, Aegis, Jamin Bales, Historocrane, James Lowry, Ken Starr, Reef Marley, Hannah B888, Jackson Ashworth, Metus Midman, Kelly and Chris Malink, Plastic Fork, Mike Galvin, and Miss Rogue Merc. And last, but certainly not least, I want to say a personal, special, heartfelt thank you to all of my top tier Patreon supporters. These are the War Masters, the people who have truly gone above and beyond the Call of Duty. So a massive thank you to Alan Blunt III, Amy DeSweet, Bon Bon Vert, Ken Starr, Mark Panconi, Ross Miller, Sawfish Trombone, John Stubbs, Diesel Fox, and August Varney. Thank you guys. Your ongoing and incredibly generous support makes a huge difference and is a big part of how I'm able to do Mordian Glory full time. I hope you all enjoyed today's video. Thank you for watching. And of course, as always, I'll see you guys next time.